Let's talk about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and how they fit into the long history of privately issued currency. While the technology underlying cryptocurrencies is new, the core idea of non-government issued money has been around a long time, and usually it existed to solve problems that sovereign currency could not. In the United States, the government is not the only entity legally allowed to issue money. Private citizens and businesses are allowed to do so too, and throughout US history they've done this. This type of money is referred to as private money, and it had mostly disappeared from circulation until Bitcoin was created in 2009. Today more than 8,000 cryptocurrencies exist, and more are appearing every day. The extreme volatility that we see in cryptocurrencies, mostly caused by Elon Musk's Twitter activity, highlights that most people view them as more of a speculative vehicle than as usable money right now. Historically, when private currencies were widespread in the United States, they were used for day-to-day spending by the general public, and people mostly just hoped that they would hold their value. Before the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and the printing of the first Federal Reserve notes, hundreds of banks in the United States issued thousands of different kinds of currency, which were as a group the effective currency of the country. So why were these private currencies so popular and so widely used? Well, initially in the colonial era, there just wasn't enough sovereign currency to go around. Later, huge amounts of money were printed during the American Revolution to pay the troops, which led to hyperinflation and food riots. The British government printed counterfeit US currency during the revolution too, to finance their war effort and to undermine the rebellion. This experience made the founding fathers of the United States quite wary of paper money. So they gave Congress the right to issue money, but forbid the individual states from doing so. They allowed private citizens and private companies to create their own forms of money too. And thus in the 1800s, much of the country's paper currency consisted of notes issued by private banks, which were not backed by the government. And if one of these banks went bankrupt, its currency would become worthless. Private money was an innovation that arose to fill voids left by the government provided or sovereign currency of the time. Studying the various examples of private money taught economists a lot about the qualities money must have for it to be useful and generally accepted. So what lessons have been taken from the history of private money and what might they imply for our money today and in the future? Well, the history of private currencies in the United States begins with the first European settlers, many of whom arrived in America with the idea that huge deposits of gold and silver would be found. No sizable supplies were discovered, and the settlers had to rely on official British currency that had been brought over and on a variety of foreign coins to supplement it, all of which was in short supply. Economies can't really function if there's no way of transferring value or storing wealth. So commodities like tobacco, beaver skins, and wampum, which is money made from a type of clamshell, served as currency at various times. Wampum was one of the most popular alternatives, as it was already in widespread use by Native Americans, and so it became legal tender in several colonies. Before the American Revolution, the shortage of coin was such a problem that colonial loan offices began issuing bills of credit. Local banks additionally took in gold and gave out banknotes in return, including some in very small denominations, which were badly needed for daily purchases. One of the problems with this bank-issued currency was that it couldn't circulate too far from the issuing bank, where the notes could be redeemed back into gold and silver. Businesses located at a distance often only accepted these notes at a discount or wouldn't take them at all. To make the notes more useful, some banks made deals with others in nearby cities to accept each other's notes. Buyers and sellers back then had to be very careful about the bills they took. If a bank went bust, its currency would become worthless, so merchants and consumers often used brokers who understood the quality of the different banknotes. 
Another danger during this period was counterfeiting. Much as governments do today, banks back then went to a great deal of effort to make their bills hard to copy using engraving, watermarking and distinctive images. In 1690, the province of Massachusetts Bay created the first authorised paper money, known as Bills of Credit, issued by any government in the Western world, and the other colonies soon followed suit. The long list of private currency issuers in US history doesn't just include banks. Canal and railroad companies, coal mining and lumber companies all issued money, often called scrip, to pay their workers. Merchants, farmers and community groups also created their own money. All of these forms of private money arose to meet real needs that were not being met by government-provided money. These private currencies were needed to make small purchases. They allowed for a medium of exchange in remote locations and provided a means of exchange during financial panics. Okay, so first up, why were there so many private currencies to begin with? Well, while the US Treasury was issuing coins and a limited number of banknotes by the 1800s, paper money was mostly being issued by state and national banks. These were private currencies, but they weren't the only ones, because banks were prohibited from printing small denomination bills by their regulators. There were some economic theories underlying this prohibition, one of which was that small denominations could cause inflation as prices could easily be increased by small amounts if small denominations were available. Adam Smith argued in The Wealth of Nations that small denominations of banknotes should be banned in order to prevent inflation. His logic was that back then banknotes were mostly redeemable into gold or silver coin. Smith believed that the public would have a greater incentive to redeem large denomination notes into precious metals, and this frequent redemption would keep the banks honest. The fact that notes were frequently being redeemed would prevent banks from printing more notes than they could redeem with the gold and silver that they kept on hand. The idea was that stopping the banks from printing unbacked paper money would prevent inflation. So at the time, the smallest denomination of federally issued currency and bank issued currency was the $1 bill. And one dollar represented a large amount of money back then. In the 1800s, a laborer typically earned around five dollars per week. A newspaper cost a penny and a pound of bacon cost around five cents. Trying to buy everyday items was impossible using state and national banknotes. This meant that there was a liquidity problem, and not only that, it got worse over time. National banknotes could be issued only in denominations of one dollar or more up until 1879, and after 1879 only in denominations of five dollars or more. By 1882, all smaller denomination national banknotes had been taken out of circulation. Now, the Treasury did issue silver coins in dollar, half dollar, quarter, dime, and half dime denominations. But due to a shortage of silver, there weren't enough of these coins to go around. One problem was that the silver in the coins was worth more than the coins, so people would hoard them. Without small denomination coins being available, businesses often paid a premium for them in order to be able to make change for their customers. When the Civil War broke out, the country found itself in the midst of a war boom without a widely accepted currency unit smaller than the $5 bill. This situation meant that there was a role for privately issued small denomination currency, and private individuals and companies stepped in to meet the need. They made both paper money and tokens. In 1862, Congress reacted to the private money situation by forbidding private citizens or companies from issuing paper currency in denominations of less than a dollar. In order to avoid legal problems, private issuers of paper money began denominating their currency in services, for example, miles of railroad service, instead of in dollars. In 1864, 
Congress went on to prohibit private coinage intended for use as current money. However, the courts have frequently upheld the private issuance of coins or paper money if it circulated locally or was redeemable in goods or services and not in dollars. The period from 1837 to 1864 in the United States is often referred to as the free banking era. During this period, if a currency issuer went bankrupt or just left town, the notes they had issued would become worthless, and this happened a lot. These banks earned the nickname of wildcat banks for a reputation of unreliability. They were often situated in remote areas said to be inhabited more by wildcats than by people. The National Bank Act of 1863 ended the wildcat bank period. The government created paper money that followed was far simpler to use than private currencies and more reliable. But widespread private money was not yet done with. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was a boom in mining and lumber. The natural resources companies were usually located in remote parts of the country, far from banks. They would issue their own money, commonly known as scrip, redeemable in goods sold at the company store. Workers were not delighted to be paid this way and often sold their scrip at a discount to get money that could be used for purchases elsewhere. The use of scrip was widely criticised at the time, but the courts ruled that it didn't violate the 1862 and 1864 Banking Acts, since it was not intended to circulate widely as money. Other problems that private currency solved, historically, was that they could fill in for government-issued currency during financial panics. During the Great Depression, bank runs were common. Banks often responded to runs by suspending withdrawals, temporarily refusing to allow customers to take cash from their bank accounts. Bank runs became so severe during the Depression that in March 1933, President Roosevelt declared a four-day bank holiday, later extended to a week, closing banks across the nation. In response, school districts, local businesses, and individuals issued private money. State and city governments issued their own local money as well. Businesses unable to make payrolls paid workers in scrip, which was usually redeemable into official currency once banks reopened. The acceptability of scrip depended heavily on the credibility of the issuer. People were more likely to accept municipally issued scrip if the municipality would also accept it in payment of taxes. Over time, private currencies mostly disappeared. They caused as many problems as they solved. There were exceptions, though. The Ithaca Hour, for example, was a private currency in Ithaca, New York, founded in 1991, with the goal of keeping capital in the local economy. One Ithaca Hour was valued at $10 and was generally recommended to be used as payment for one hour's work. It was one of the longest running local currency systems, but today is no longer in circulation. So what problems occurred with private currencies and what did people learn from their use? Well, one lesson we can take from the history of private currencies is that a given currency's success was heavily tied to the quality of its issuer. People needed to believe that the value of a currency would be honoured when they got around to spending it. Another observation is that historically private currencies were extremely localised. They didn't circulate widely. Additionally, we can see that ease of redemption mattered a lot. Money that was hard to redeem was either discounted or not accepted at all. With the emergence of the internet, the inadequacy of cash as a method for making payments in the growing world of e-commerce seemed to lay the foundation for the emergence of electronic money. When purchases over the internet expanded, the vast majority of internet purchases were made using credit cards. Brokered payment systems like PayPal emerged to facilitate the payment between a buyer and seller. The buyer authorizes the broker to transfer funds out of an account held with the broker to the seller of the product. 
The broker has all the private information regarding the parties involved, and buyers and sellers do not need to know this information to complete a transaction. It's inaccurate to call these payment innovations new forms of money, though. They're just new ways to make payments with significant transaction fees borne by the users. In China, Alipay and WeChat Pay dominate consumer payments. Money flows through these digital ecosystems that blend social media, commerce and banking. These payment systems are tied to underlying bank accounts. In Africa, M-Pesa is a mobile phone-based payments and microfinancing service launched in 2007 by Vodafone and Safaricom, the largest mobile network operator in Kenya. It's operated by mobile network operators, not banks. M-Pesa customers can deposit and withdraw money from a network of agents that include mobile airtime resellers and retail outlets. The system allows the unbanked to make electronic payments with relatively low fees. These systems are very different to how things work in the United States and Europe, where banks and credit card companies dominate. While big banks might worry about technologies like WeChat Pay and M-Pesa taking their business, it may not happen too quickly. American consumers love credit card rewards programs and the built-in fraud protections. On top of this, US bank account deposits are backed by insurance from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is attractive to consumers. As I said though, these systems are just technologies for transferring money. They're not private currencies. Cryptocurrencies are the newest innovation in the private currency space. They are decentralized private digital currencies that use cryptography to safeguard transactions and control the creation of additional units of currency. Bitcoin issued its first block in 2009 and has quickly become the best known and largest cryptocurrency in terms of total market value. But as I mentioned earlier, more than 8,000 different cryptocurrencies exist today. Cryptocurrencies are mostly used for speculative purposes right now, rather than as actual currencies. People are not usually being paid in cryptocurrencies, and goods are not priced in them either. Most cryptocurrencies are not backed by anything other than the faith of the people who own them, unlike a lot of the historic private currencies that were at least supposedly backed by precious metals, US dollars, or exchangeable into goods at the company store. Cryptocurrencies are not cheaper to transact with either. They tend to be expensive and slow. It takes around 10 minutes for a Bitcoin transaction to be validated, and the average fee for just one transaction is around $20. Ethereum, the second largest cryptocurrency, processes transactions slightly faster, but also has high fees. As I mentioned earlier, Private currencies were historically used because they solved problems with sovereign currency. They filled in when there was a shortage of coin, when there were no small denominations, when banks closed during the depression and so on. What problems do cryptocurrencies solve today? Well, cryptocurrencies first appeared in 2009, right after the global financial crisis, and some of their popularity relates to a lack of faith in modern central banking and monetary policy. They grew in popularity during the COVID pandemic, and this resurgence could relate to concerns over the huge government spending to keep economies alive. A lot of new regulation came in the wake of the global financial crisis too. Things like FATCA and other anti-money laundering rules, which made transferring funds using traditional means slower and more expensive. Cryptocurrencies have been popular amongst those worried about government surveillance too. This includes criminals who wish to hide their financial dealings, but also those living under oppressive government regimes. People who worry about inflation and who don't trust the government tend to like cryptocurrencies. 
Cryptocurrencies may or may not persevere in the long run, but they are bringing transformative changes to money and finance. The prospect of competition from these private currencies has pushed central banks around the world to consider digital versions of sovereign currencies. In the long run, it's unlikely that 8,000 cryptocurrencies will remain in use. The exchange rate between the dollar and the yen fluctuates by as much as 15% year to year, even though the fundamentals of the two economies show much less volatility. A world with thousands of additional currencies would leave people living with exchange rate chaos. The benefits of central bank digital currencies are not obvious to me either. Even the Federal Reserve has stated that the design of such a currency would raise important monetary policy, financial stability, consumer protection, legal and privacy considerations. Let me know your thoughts on the pros and cons of private currencies in the comments section below. If you found this interesting, you should check out my video on John Law, the inventor of paper money next. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Bye.